All right. If you have your Bibles, and I hope you have, the Word of God, I want you to turn with me to the book of, uh, let me find it here now. Luke 1, verse 17. Luke chapter number 1 and verse number 17. Scripture says, And he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Father, bless this holy word now. In thy name I pray. Amen. Amen. You can be seated, folks. John the Baptist, as you know, he's called the Baptist because he's the baptizer. I know some Baptist writers say he was the first Baptist in the Baptist church. Uh, I certainly don't agree with that. But in any event, John him, said of himself, he says, I am friend of the bridegroom. I'm looking as far as I can go, the law and the prophets were until John, but since that time the kingdom of God is preached, every man presseth into it. John the Baptist was two things, the end of an old era and the, the precursor or the forerunner of a new era. And so John fits the gap, uh, the gap between the two. And it says here in Luke chapter number one and verse 17 about John said, he will go in the spirit and power of Elias. Now that's a prophecy, but why would they say that? Why is it necessary to say the spirit and power of Elias? The reason for that is because John's going to be connected with Elijah the prophet. In the Old Testament, one of the last passages that you'll find is where he says, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and terrible day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is a prophecy of the Old Testament constantly brought forth, well known. Day of the Lord is nothing new. The day of Christ that you read about in 2 Thessalonians 2 is an entirely new thing and completely different from the day of the Lord. It's very important not to mix stuff up because when you begin to mix things up, then you get mixed up and you get in trouble because the Bible begins to uh, close itself to you and you can't understand what you're reading. But John said, the, Luke says here of John that he went into the spirit and the power of Elias. That meant that John the Baptist uh, could be more than just John the Baptist. He had a very important thing. He prepared Israel for the coming of the Lord. He was the, he was the forerunner. And uh, as I said a moment ago, the, uh, the go-between between the old era and the new. But in Malachi chapter number four, he said, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Now, it's been 2,000 years since the Lord Jesus was here, and we call this the age of grace. And we add the 4,000 before that gives us 6,000 years. And we're on the, on, on the, here we are in 20, we're on the cusp of a seventh millennium of the 7,000th year of God's, uh, uh, God's uh, doing with man. And of course, seven is the number of completion. I'm a premillennialist. I believe in the millennium. I believe it's real. I believe the thousand year period of time. They ruled and reigned with Christ a thousand years. I believe that. And this is what's called eschatology. When you get into the reign of Christ, you get into the rapture of the church of God, or you get into the kingdom of God and all these things, they lead up to what's called eschatology. The Greek word eschatos means last or the end. So eschatology is the doctrine of the last things or the things that end or the day of the Lord. So John the Baptist fits into a unique place in Scripture. And if you'll follow him with me tonight, I believe we can really get a hold of something that can open up the New Testament. It's important. When I first got saved, I really didn't have a mentor to help me uh, lay down and understand the things that I'm giving you tonight. But uh, what I'm giving you tonight uh, is the kind of thing that if you'll get a hold of it, get the notes and uh, listen to it, watch it again later, You'll be surprised how the New Testament opens up. Matthew chapter 17, verses 1 through 3 says, And after six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John his brother, and bringeth them up into a high mountain apart, 
and was transfigured before them. And his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. Now watch verse number three. This is so important. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias talking with him. Now he said, I'll send you Elias the prophet before the coming of the day of the Lord. And here we have Moses and Elijah and the Lord Jesus Christ being transformed on top of a mountain. In Matthew chapter number 17 and verse number 9, it says, And they came down from the mountain, and Jesus charged them, saying, Tell the vision to no man until the Son of Man be risen again from the dead. And his disciples asked him, saying, Well, why then say the scriptures that Elias must first come? Now you can put that together, can't you? You see, they're looking at the Bible. Well, why does the Bible say that Elias must first come? The reason they said that is because they just saw him. They just saw him. They're trying to figure this out. They're trying to make sense of what they had just seen. And of course, that's good. That's, that's good. Uh, so he said, Jesus answered and said unto them, Elias truly shall first come and restore all things. But I say unto you that Elias is come already. And they knew him not. Now, wait a minute. <laughs> did they not just see Elias, the real Elias? Of course they did. But now he's introducing something new to them. He's showing them how that Almighty God is able to work all things after the counsel of his own will. He said, uh, I say that Elias has come already, and they knew him not, but have done to him whatsoever they listed. Likewise shall also the Son of Man suffer of them. Then the disciples understood that he spake unto them of John the Baptist. So now we have something that teaches us about the Bible, and that is that one person can be another person. Just like I said this morning, so important, that Solomon, for the second half of his life, or when he became apostate, became a type of the Antichrist. Now that angers some people for you to say something like that. But folks, did you know how many people are out there in this world right now that study their Bible that believe that Solomon went to hell? See how quiet it is in here? When you read about David, you read where he repented, don't you? He repented, no question about it. Solomon is kind of a tacit thing. In other words, it's, uh, it, it, it alludes to it, but there's no direct statement in the Bible where he did. Now, let me say this tonight. I do not believe Solomon went to hell. I don't believe that for a minute. But why would people say that? They will say that because his apostasy was as deep as it gets. He was, it was as bad as it can come. Little babies died in the arms of Moloch. They died. He destroyed the kingdom that David had built. He destroyed it. When Solomon died, the kingdom was split, and Rehoboam, his son, reigned in his stead, but only over two tribes. And ten in the north, uh, Jeroboam took these ten. And, of course, it was apostate from the start and stayed apostate. Never did serve uh, the Lord God. Hezekiah and Josiah were two fine kings of the southern kingdom. They loved the Lord, and they served the Lord in their lifetime. So what I'm trying to say to you tonight is that uh, this is not a condemnation of Solomon. It's simply an observation. You learn a lot by observing. Simply observe. Read. Pray. Lord, show me what's going on here. And you'll find that John the Baptist now could have been Elijah. Well, why would he have been Elijah? Why was that necessary? It was necessary to fulfill the prophecy that Elijah must first come. And he did, of course, did come. He came in the person of John the Baptist. Now this presents a problem for us tonight to try to figure this out. We've had 2,000 years of church history, haven't we? 2,000 years. Go to the Old Testament and find that for me, if you would, please. You won't. You won't. You won't. You'll find the church in type, but that's about as far as it goes. The Apostle Peter talked about the church. He talked about the believers, and he said, these men of God, uh, they, they sought they, to look into this wisdom and to know it, and they couldn't do it, that it wasn't to be revealed in their time, but later. They searched the scriptures, and yet it wasn't there. The apostle Peter says that there are certain scriptures that are hard to be understood, and he meant that. He meant that. The Bible is the kind of book that rewards you for a lifetime of study. Yes. Amen. Yes. Say that again. It's the kind of book that rewards you for a lifetime of study. It will continually open up something for you if you want to see it. It'll never get dry. It'll never run out. It'll never die because it's a living book. 
And you can spend your life studying the Bible and until the day you draw your last breath of air, you marvel at the book you have in your hand. Amen. Amen. You marvel at it. And I just want to show you a little bit tonight so you can, so you can get a hold of what, I, what I'm talking about. They understood that he spake unto them of John the Baptist. Now the Bible says in Matthew chapter 18 and verse number 7, this is, this is a remarkable statement. And this goes along with the theme that I'm trying to show you. Woe unto the world because of offenses. For it must needs be that offenses come. But woe to that man by whom the offense cometh. All right, there's two points here. Point number one, they're going to come, but you don't have to be part of it. That's what he's saying. That's exactly what he's saying. In other words, it's conditional. You can make your choices. It's just like the Antichrist. The spirit of the Antichrist has been here for 2,000 years. There are many people out here, folks tonight, that are full of the spirit of Antichrist, you see, and one of them will embrace it to the point that he becomes the man of sin, the Antichrist. So in every generation, every generation, there has been some person that qualifies to be the Antichrist. That's the point. You see what I mean? That's the point. Now, when John the Baptist lived out his life, the Lord Jesus told him, he said, among women, those that are born among women, there hath not risen a greater than John. John, well, keep that in mind. John the Baptist fulfilled his ministry. He did what he was here for. But his ministry could have been something far different from what it was. That's the point. It could have, been, it could have applied to something entirely different. You see, there was a situation with Israel when Christ first showed up that he went only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Didn't go to the Gentiles. He said, Do, go not in the way of the Gentiles or in the city of the Samaritans, but go into the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And when they came to him, a Samaritan or, uh, or any of the Syrophoenicians or anyone, he said, he said I, to essentially, he said, I didn't come for you. He said, I came for Israel. But did he come for Israel only? Or was he saying that I came for Israel now? But that does not rule you out in the future. So the time element comes into play. If you understand the Bible, you must understand that things run their course, then that's it. And something else picks up and continues on. In the fullness of time, God sent his son. Remember that? Made of a woman, made under the law in the fullness of time. All right, Law and prophets were until John, but since that time, the kingdom of God is preached. So the time element it's a good thing to help when you understand the Bible and begin to study it. Who am I talking to? Who's this talking to? What's this about? What's, what's the context of this? Uh, if this is a prophecy, who does it relate to? Is there anything in there for me? And this is how you study the Bible. And this keeps you out of a lot of trouble. So John the Baptist uh, fulfilled his ministry. God used him. And no question in my mind that John the Baptist was gathered to his fathers and he went to paradise until the Lord emptied paradise when he resurrected from the dead. Now, let's tie John the Baptist in with something here tonight that, uh, that'll help us begin to make sense of it. In the book of uh, Isaiah chapter number six, there's a prophecy given. And I won't go there with you tonight because I'm going to read the New Testament applications of that. Here's another uh, thing that helps in studying the Bible so much. When a New Testament, when an Old Testament passage is quoted in the New Testament, how do they apply it? See, that's a great lesson to learn. How do they apply that? And we have to take them at their, at, at their word. If they make an application, accept the application that they made. Now I want you to look at Matthew chapter 13 and verse number 12. For whosoever hath to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. But whosoever hath not from him shall be taken away even that he hath. Therefore speak I to them in parables. Now we know what parables are for. You see, most of the time all you hear from folks about a parable, and it's okay to say it's, a, it's, a, it's, an, it's an earthly lesson with a heavenly meaning. or something of that nature, a parable, okay? And they limit it to that. Folks, that's just scratching the surface. The parable is for a purpose. The parable is to reveal to those who are able to receive it, the message in it. But the parable for the most part is given to close the eyes of others that they'll not understand it. That's exactly what he says here. 
Look at this. Therefore I speak to them in parables, because seeing they see not, hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. And in them, now watch this, is fulfilled the prophecy of Esaias, which saith, By hearing ye shall hear and shall not understand, seeing ye shall see and shall not perceive. For this people's heart is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. So something now is happening to these people. Who are these people? It's not Gentiles. The prophecy in Isaiah chapter number 6 is talking about Israel. These quotations refer directly to Israel, to the people 2,000 years ago that were alive at the coming of Christ. And so what is this? Well, this is a statement saying that the prophecy of Isaiah is being fulfilled right before your very eyes. See that? Now that's a great way to understand the Bible. Let the Bible interpret itself and let it tell you what it's doing. And you don't have to scratch around in the dark. In Matthew chapter number 12, this tells you why he said that. Matthew 12, verse 13. Then saith he to the man, stretch forth thine hand. He stretched it forth, and it was restored whole like as the other. Now look at verse 14. Then the Pharisees went out and held a council against him, how they might destroy him. See that? They wanted to do away with him, destroy this man. Now the high priest told them why they wanted to get rid of him because they'll come and take away our place and nation. Had nothing to do with their sins. Our place and our nation. About 99.9% .9 of the time, what you hear from a politician, a government official, or most people is for public consumption. They say it to you because they feel like that's what you need to hear and that's good enough. But the truth of the matter is, it goes much deeper. Pull away the facade and let's see what's really going on. What's really happening here? And of course he said, they had taken a counsel against him how they might destroy him. Obviously, they had already chosen to reject him. No part will not have this man rule over us. But God's a gracious God. He's a merciful God. Did anybody in here tonight reject the Lord more than one time? Oh yeah. You were convicted. And your stubbornness and rebellion, you got up and walked off or walked away or whatever. Of course you did. Long suffering comes in there. God's a long suffering God. We'll not have any to be perish. God is not sitting, <laughs> sitting on some kind of a little man-made contrived throne with his feelings on his shoulder. That's not God. Oh, that's a lot of people we know. <laughs> but that's not God. No, 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 no. No, no, no. No, 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 no. The Almighty's a gracious, long-suffering being. He'll put up with a lot from you. He will. He'll put up with a lot. And then there's a line you cross. And when you cross that line, then it's time for him to begin to uh, chasten and scourge and whatever else he needs to do. Now, I want you to look again. They quote this scripture in John chapter number 12 and verse number 37. They quote Isaiah 6 again. The fact of the matter is, how many has ever heard of Ethelbert Bullinger and his companion Bible? All right. It's an outstanding book. Now, there are things that Brother Bullinger says that I don't agree with. It's like anything, you know, you recommend. You're not saying carte blanche, I agree with everything they say. No. But you point them to something that can be very helpful. When I got a hold of the companion Bible by, by Ethelbert Bullinger, and got into his interpretation of Isaiah 6 and the notes that he made, it began to open up the New Testament for me. And that was about 30 years ago, 35, maybe 40 years ago. It's been a long time, but it began to open the Bible. And you would believe, like in the two on the road to Emmaus, how it excited me. I mean, it renewed a fire in me to study the Word of God because the Bible is not written on a first grade level to first graders. Although there's much in there that they can, they can get from it. The Bible is written that you may spiritually discern it because of the living word that you're taking into your heart. If the word's alive, that means it can interpret what you're reading of itself. Amen? Amen. Yes. So look at Matthew chapter number, uh, John 12 rather. But though he had done, verse 37, but though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him. See, in John, theme of John is believe. 
but that the saying of Esaias the prophet, now look at this, he's quoting Isaiah 6, might be fulfilled which he spake, Lord, who hath believed our report? And to whom hath the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore they could not believe. Now that's something to meditate on. I mean, really? If God blinds you, you're blind, son. <laughs> Amen. If he closes the door, the door's closed. That's right. If the Holy Ghost departs, he's gone. We cannot conjure up anything spiritual. We cannot look into the spiritual truths of God unless he opens them up to us. Canst thou by searching find out God? No. We are totally dependent upon him to reveal himself to us in a spiritual context. Now all you got to do is walk outside and look at this. Look at the stars in the sky and in the daytime look at the beauty of the creation and you have to just say to yourself, my goodness gracious, this didn't pop up. Somebody made all this. All right, that's what's called the teleological argument of the existence of God. Here it is. Somebody made it. This exists. Somebody had to make this. This didn't come of his own. I've got a watch on my hand right here. This watch was not, didn't just all of a sudden, boom, came into being. Somebody, over centuries, no question, worked and worked and worked and essentially perfected the watch. And now, of course, the one I've got on, I don't even have to wind. All you've got to do is stick a battery in it. And it's like that automobile you're going to go out and get in out there. I was a professional mechanic for years. I understand a lot about what makes that thing tick. But any more than new automobiles, I look at it and I think, good night, man, there's more computer here than there is car. <laughs> so it's hard to know where to start. But somebody a lot bigger than us made all this. Amen. So they could not believe because the Messiah said again, he hath blinded their eyes, hardened their heart, that they should not see with their eyes, understand with their heart, and be converted. I should heal them. These things said Esaias when he saw his glory and spake of him. This is in reference to John 11, where it says, They took counsel together for to put him to death. Now, here's what he's saying. He's saying these people have the word. They've got the light. They've got privilege. And the Jew did. They've got the Bible, the oracles of God. They've got the light. They've got all of this. Yet in spite of all of this, they refuse to believe. But I want you to look at Romans 11, verse 1. Uh, verse 1. Saul, Paul, Saul of Tarsus, Paul, starts out the 11th chapter of Romans by asking a question. Now look at it. I say then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. God hath not cast away his people, which what? He foreknew. Watch ye not what the scripture saith? Elias how he maketh intercession to God against Israel, for Israel. Elijah, in the sight of God, is the prophet that represents Israel. Okay? That's him. He's Israel's prophet. You remember the Mount Carmel and the prophets of Baal, all that? This is, this is Elijah's unique position. This is why he showed up on top of that mountain with Moses. Because they were showing up, they were there to represent Israel. Israel, the ministry to Israel, the prophecy to Israel and all of that. This is why I believe that Moses and Elijah are the two witnesses of Revelation chapter number 11. You know, and I'm not going to argue with a man over that. And, you know, if you fall out over that, that's okay. But that's who I believe it is, Moses and Elijah. Why? Because they are witnessing to, not the church, Israel. That's right. That's what they're here for. So the scripture says they took counsel to put him to death. As the truth of the matter is, every time I find the word counsel in the Bible, it's in a bad connotation. Amen. That's why we don't have any councils here. <laughs> we don't want to start any councils, do we? <coughs> councils are not a good thing. Now I want you to notice the next time is in Acts chapter 28, verse 25. Now these are progressive and they are bringing us to a point. Acts 28, 25. When they agreed not among themselves, they departed. 
after that Paul had spoken one word, well spake the Holy Ghost by Esaias the prophet unto our fathers. I'll stop there for just a moment. If you get Bullinger's book, Companion Bible, you'll find where he says this scripture is quoted seven times, then he makes three applications, and in each one of those three, one of them is speaking, Jehovah speaking, the other one the Son is speaking, and the other one the Holy Ghost is speaking. That includes the full body of the Trinity. And look what we just read here in, 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 uh, in uh, Acts chapter number 25. Well spake who? The Holy Ghost. See this? By Esaias unto our fathers. Go unto this people saying, Hear ye shall hear, shall not understand, seeing ye shall see and perceive and not perceive. For the heart of this people is cracked, waxed gross, their ears are dull of hearing, their eyes have they closed, lest they should see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, should be converted, I should heal them. Be it known therefore to you to the salvation of God is sent unto the what? Gentiles. Can Jews be saved? Well, of course they can. What he's talking about is the main force, the thrust, the purpose. What this Bible has brought us to the point now it is about to the Gentiles, and lo and behold, when he saved Saul of Tarsus, what did he say that he was going to do? His ministry would be to the what? Gentiles. And he was. He was. He wrote that New Testament, and he wrote that New Testament to the church at Galatia, Ephesus, Thessalonica, see, on and on it goes, Philippi, Gentiles. And he was the minister to the Gentiles. The churches were built, Gentile churches. And this is the purpose of Paul. Before he shows up, there's something else that's got to happen. Now you'll find here that they're blinded. Now I want you to look at something that he says over here in the book of Romans. The Apostle Paul. Romans chapter number 11, verse 33. Romans 11, 33. Paul was an educated man. He sat at the feet of Gamaliel. The apostle Peter was a fisherman. Okay? He was not educated like Paul. Now stop right now. But he wrote scripture and he was inspired of God when he wrote it. In other words, the book of 1 Peter is on the same level as Ephesus, uh, the Ephesians or any of the rest of them. You see what I'm saying? We're not talking about man's ability. But the point is this. Saul of Tarsus was educated. And he says right here, Oh, the depths, Romans eleven thirty three, Oh, the depths of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who hath known the mind of the Lord? Or who hath been his counselor? Or who hath first given to him? And it should be recompensed to him again. Now watch this. For of him and through him and to him are all things to whom be glory forever. Amen. Amen. That's something. Yes. I would, it's for young people to memorize the scripture, that'd be one of the first I'd memorize. Of him, through him, and to him are all things. He worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. Though it appears like a complete failure, there's no failure involved. That's simply the way God did it at the time for a purpose. He does not fail. He cannot fail. It's impossible for God to fail. For example, the Bible said when he came into this world, he tasted death for every man. Now that's a strange thing. When the Lord takes me from this body, I won't be tasting death. This flesh, it will be finished and my soul and my spirit will depart, right? Okay. But the Bible says he took upon him uh, when he was, when he was, when he was uh, incarnate, he likewise took part of the same, referring to the incarnation, right? Part of the same. Now this is what I want to make, I just, tonight this is what I want you to, I want to make you think. When he died on that cross, his body died. His body was dead. No question about it. They shoved that spear in his side. He was dead. They laid him in a tomb. He was dead. They sealed it with a stone. He was dead. For three days, his body lay in that tomb. But what about his soul and spirit? He said, Father, speaking into thy hands, I do what? Commend my spirit. 
The Apostle Peter says that he descended into the lower parts of the earth and he had something to declare. That's his soul. All right. There's the three parts that make up the incarnate God, the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. But now in your case, when you die, it's not going to be exactly like him. You don't have the power to bring your spirit back into your body. But he did. He could call his spirit back. And when he called his spirit back, he himself by his own intelligence and his own being entered back into that body. I can't do that. I can't do that. So in plain words, death, he approached death, entered into death. Death took its toll. But death did not have a complete grasp upon him. So therefore he tasted it. <laughs> yeah, he tasted it. What death could offer. And the death, the dying of Christ was the death of all deaths. The greatest death there was. And so when the Lord Jesus Christ arose from the dead, death, death died. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Death died. And you no longer fear death. Hallelujah to God. He that liveth, he that liveth in me shall what? Never die. Amen. So that's just a, a few little things there to kind of help us along the way. But I want you to, I want you to see something else. And I, this is what I love about, about the Apostle Paul. He says things and expects you, once you read it, to say, Lord, now, this man here said this. What, what's going on here? What does this mean? Because the Bible says my life is hid with Christ in God. Paul said that. He said that. My life is hid with Christ in God. The Apostle Paul said things that they're powerful and wonderful when he says them, but you, you, there's nothing to relate it to on this earth. You have, to relate, you have to get the wisdom from God. So of him, he's the source of all. <laughs> all. 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 I heard no boy say one time, well, what does the word all mean? And they said, all. He said, that's right. All. <laughs> For of him, therefore, all right, of him, all things. And like in Isaiah 45, when he said, I create evil. Okay. He's not the source of evil, but he's the source of the ability for it to come into existence with that anointed cherub that covereth. All right. But he said, through him, all right, Paul said, through him. In plain words, it has to be worked out in his mind, his purpose. God's purpose is not my purpose. Isaiah 55, my ways are not your ways, neither are my thoughts your thoughts, saith the Lord. The heavens higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. My mind is not on the same level with God. When I begin to think like I think like God, then I'm full of myself and I'm arrogant. Amen. 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 So through him, in plainer words, that means he processes everything that happens. It can't happen apart from him. That's quite a thing. But we're talking about God. All right, through him. And then what does it say? To him. Over there in the book of Romans chapter number two, it makes a, it makes a statement over there. Let's see if we can find it tonight. Romans two. The, Rome, the book of Romans is a good book, folks. Well, the truth is, turn anywhere. They're all good books. You know? <laughs> Romans 2. Okay, there's a passage in here that just came to my mind. And maybe somebody can help me find it in here tonight. I'm pretty sure, about 99% sure, it's the second chapter of Romans, where it talks about God being judged. That's when, that's when they, he judges the secrets of men. It says, when thou art judged. Now, here's the thing about something like this. When we find it, you'll remember it. This is one of the ways you learn. You'll remember it. It's in here. Where is it? Where? No, that's not it. What? No, that's not it either. 
it's in here. Shucks, we got 50, 100, 2,000 people looking at this. Surely, where did you say 15? 16? No, the judge of secrets of men. 3, 4? Okay. See, I was wrong. There you are. That's it. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. If you won't use another man's brains, good indication you don't have any of your own, right? Yeah. Amen. Now look at this thing. Chapter 3, verse 4. God forbid. Yea, let God be true, but every man a liar, as it is written, that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings, okay, and mightest overcome when what? Thou art judged. So what's that mean? That means that when all the creation, okay, all the creation faces the eternal being, almighty God, everything that's ever happened, everything that's ever been said, all, everything, everything, every, all the wrongs that have been done, everything, 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 when it comes back to him, he'll be justified in what he did, the way he did it, and what it led to, because he's almighty God. And this is, I say, to Abraham when he stood there outside of uh, Sodom. He said, I'm but dust and ashes. That's what he called himself. And, that, and that, that wasn't just for show. That was real. He meant that. He said, uh, shall not the judge of the whole earth do right? Folks, that gives me more comfort than anything. Amen. It's not being able to explain a lot of things. There's a lot of things up in my mind tonight that I don't have a clear explanation for, but that one thing I believe, shall not the judge of the whole earth do right? Amen. Yes, he will do right. He can't do anything but right. And so when the Apostle Paul looks at his brethren, these are his brethren, folks. These are the Jews. He was a Jew. He was a Hebrew of the Hebrews, he called himself, remember? He said, oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments, see that? And his ways past finding out. For who hath known the mind of the Lord? Who counseled with him? Not nobody. Or who hath been his counselor? Or who hath first given to him? And it shall be, in other words, who does God owe something to? Be recompensed again for of him and through him and to him are all things. To whom be glory forever. Amen. We have a conscience, every one of us tonight. We've got a conscience. I'm, aren't you thankful for a conscience? Yes. Keeps you out of a lot of trouble. Sometimes it may keep you up at night, but a conscience is a good thing because it can be seared like a hot iron, and if that happens, it's not working anymore. So what's the purpose of the conscience? So you can make judgments. You make judgments. And we make judgments based upon our inabilities, our failures, our Faults, uh, our weaknesses, you know, our limited understanding, limited knowledge, and all this. We make judgments. This is why we have courts of law. We have 12 people seated, sitting there, a jury, and, they're going to, and the lawyers are going to try the case before them. Then they make a judgment. We make judgments all the time. But there's not a one of us tonight capable of making the kind of judgment that he makes. When he makes a judgment, it is absolute and pure. And shall not the judge of the whole earth do right? Amen. Yeah, he does. He does. They fulfilled Isaiah chapter number 6, 700 years before it happened. It was written and it was fulfilled. For every dot, every dash, every tittle, the word of God was filled. And it was filled full and fulfilled. And you'll see the day when God comes back to this earth as he said he would. Just like he said, old fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. <laughs> I'm guilty of that. Thanks be unto God for his long suffering. Amen. Amen, folks. Amen. Amen. Next time somebody tries to simplify the Bible, there are passages simple. They're simple. Simple to be understood. But <laughs> a lot of it is not. A lot of it is not. Father, bless your word and thank you for the time tonight. Our Heavenly Father, it's your word, Lord. I believe your word. You know that. You know that. I, don't, I believe the Bible. I don't have to tell you that. You know it. But my Father, tonight, there's a lot of it I don't understand. Still don't understand it. I can't, I can't wrap my mind around it. But I know you. 
and I know you'll do, you'll do right. You'll do right. You'll do what's right. Shall not the judge of the whole earth? Yes, you have to do right. You can't do anything but right. In thy holy name I pray, amen.